Father's love, everyone, and welcome. This week we continue our spiritual warfare series by Alistair Begg. These two messages are entitled The Belt of Truth and the Breastplate of Righteousness. So kick back, relax. Let's see what the Spirit has to teach us this week. The following message by Alistair Begg is made available by Truth For Life. For more information, visit us online at truthforlife.org. I invite you to turn with me to Ephesians and to chapter 6 and to the passage of Scripture to which we come this morning and which is given uh, the basis for the old song that we've just sung together. Ephesians 6 and reading from verse 10. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand firm. Stand, therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth, and having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith, with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one, and take the helmet of salvation, and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, praying at all times in the Spirit, with all prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints, and also for me, that words may be given to me in opening my mouth boldly to proclaim the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in chains, that I may declare it boldly as I ought to speak. Amen. We come, gracious God, entirely dependent upon the work of the Holy Spirit to open our eyes to the truth of your Word, to grant us grace in order that we might believe and rest in it. So accomplish your purposes, we pray, for Jesus' sake. Amen. Well, I hope by now we're clear about a number of things. One, that the same grace which reconciles in Jesus us to God is the same grace which antagonizes us to the evil one. That as we are reading here, we're involved in a spiritual battle, a battle which is being fought against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. And that is of significance because earlier in the letter, Paul has explained to his readers that in our union with Christ, we have been raised up and seated with him uh, in the heavenly places and in the heavenly realms. And so, having been removed, as it were, uh, to the reality of being included with Christ, our union with Christ has brought us immediately into conflict with the devil. And this picture of warfare, although it is shied away from even in the church today, is nevertheless solemn, it is clear, and there is nothing that is, if you like, airy-fairy about it. Although we are seated in Christ in the heavenly places, we are also living down here on earth. Uh, The initial readers were in Ephesus. We are in Cleveland. Some of you are from different parts of the world. And it is in the routine of life, if you like, in the humdrum nature of life, that we face the challenges that are described here in the section we're considering. And uh, we've tried to make sure so far that we are not separating this section at the end of Ephesians from all that has gone before, and particularly from all that we had been considering beginning halfway through chapter 5, because it was there that we began to see what 
the Bible was saying concerning the nature of marriage, and then the realities and responsibilities of family life, and then the privileges and challenges in our everyday work events. And we tried to make the point, I reiterate it now purposefully, that it is in these very areas, not exclusively, but definitely in these very areas, that many of us become most aware of the fact that we're up against the devil's schemes. And so I find it helpful to realize uh, just how solidly realistic Paul is in teaching us in this way, uh, saving us from any sense of naivety or superficiality. I remember years ago reading a description of uh, troops who had embarked upon uh, a ship in the United Kingdom heading for France. And the writer describing the scenes on board wrote as follows. If from a group here and there came a song or noisy, noisy demonstration, it was from the young soldiers going out to the front for the first time. The others remained impassive, silent. Experience had taught them that mere knowledge of their duties and a fleeting devotion would not suffice to bear the long and bitter ordeal of battle. They required a spirit proved in the crucible of discipline. I find that very helpful as I think about spiritual warfare, the idea that if I just do what I'm supposed to do, or if I have a strong surge of emotion, uh, this uh, will manage to sustain me in the warfare. That is naive. And those who have battled long with the evil one who've lived their Christian life over a period of time know uh, just how naive it is. And it's for that reason that Paul is urging his readers here to make a stand, to take a stand. We've noticed that. It comes again in 11 and then in 13 and then in 14. And he doesn't just say to them, now go ahead and stand. He always does what he does here. And that is that he reminds them of how they can stand. Be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. He's already, back in chapter 1, prayed for them that they might have an understanding of the strength and power of God, the immeasurable greatness of his might, he says, towards those who believe that has been manifested ultimately in the raising of Jesus Christ from the dead. And so from the very beginning of his letter, he has wanted his readers to understand their identity in Christ, to understand what it means to be in union with Christ, so that when the exhortations come, they're aware of the fact that divine equipment is required, is essential, if we are going to be successful in dealing with the evil one. Now, that's why in the hymn that we have just sung, you have that lovely uh, couplet there, the arm of flesh will fail you, you dare not trust your own. You just can't uh, get by by saying, you know, if I feel strongly enough about this, I'm sure I will handle it. So uh, the encouragement to be strong in the strength of his might is then followed by his exhortation to take up the armor of God and to put on the armor of God. In passing, it's important to remind ourselves that the picture here is a united picture. Although we tend to think of this in individualistic terms, as we must in measure, well, what does it mean for me? In actual fact, he's talking about the united front, as it were, of the believers in Ephesus. Make sure he's saying to them that together you are equipped for battle. And what he provides us with is an illustration or a picture and we are looking only at this one phrase in verse 14, having fastened on the belt of truth, having fastened on the belt of truth. Now, we know Paul enough to know that uh, his imprisonment uh, meant that he was in the company of soldiers. Uh, when he wrote to Philippi, a garrison town, the Roman soldiers were everywhere. He knew that his readers understood uh, the battle uh, equipment uh, that a Roman soldier enjoyed. And so there is little doubt that that is in his mind as, and in the mind of his readers when he speaks in this way. But I don't think it is actually Paul's underlying picture, as I'll point out to you presently. 
First of all, though, the belt uh, that was worn by the Roman soldier was not a belt that was provided for decoration. I was in a store uh, in the last two weeks, and there were a whole series of belt buckles that were quite uh, magnificent. And I thought about, uh, you know, I wasn't going to buy one, but I thought, I suppose this individual doesn't really wear the belt to keep their trousers up as much as to wear the buckle, so that you can say, oh, what an amazing buckle. Yes, but does it, keep your, does it keep your trousers up? That's the real question. So what he's talking about here is not, is not something by way of decoration that we can walk around and display it, but rather it is foundational. Uh, the Roman would be dressed uh, in flowing garments that would be over armaments many times. And so the, uh, the, the potential for uh, progress being impeded as a result of tripping over your stuff was a real one. And therefore, part of the function of the belt was to be able to secure all that might otherwise uh, affect our ability to move and our readiness. And that, of course, is a picture that runs through the Bible. At one point, Moses is giving instruction to the people of God concerning the eating of the Passover, and the word to them is, in this manner, this is Exodus 12, in this manner you shall eat the Passover with your belt fastened. It's an interesting thing. You're going to eat the Passover with your belt fastened. Why, why is that? Well, because of the potential threat of antagonism around them, and therefore they want to be engaging in the pursuit of God in a way that they are ready uh, to take a stand for God. And that's the picture here. In the English Standard Version, which we're using, it's fastened on the belt. Uh, perhaps in the NIV it's buckling, I don't actually recall. But I do recall that in the uh, King James Version, uh, with which many of us were brought up, uh, the phraseology is having your loins girt about with truth. And uh, so that's as good an argument for a more modern translation as any I know. <laughs> you ask, ask your teenage son as he's going out, uh, for the evening with his girlfriend, let me just ask you before you go, do you have your loins girt about with truth? Now, they may come back to you and say, I'm not sure what that means. You tell them, well, let me tell you exactly what it means. Uh, that is the picture that Jesus uses when he speaks to his disciples. He says, let your loins be girded about. Translated, uh, make sure that you stay dressed for action. Or in First Peter, when you have the same phraseology, girding up the loins of your mind. Uh, Peter is, is applying the picture that his readers would understand. You know what it is to grab a hold of things and tuck it into your belt so that you don't trip yourself up and fall over and, and cause others difficulty. So he's saying the same thing in relationship to your minds. In other words, in essence, it is a metaphor for preparedness, for preparedness. There's no sense in which, uh, as you read the letters of the New Testament, the call to the Christian is anything other than really a call to warfare. I know it's not a very uh, contemporary and acceptable picture, but nevertheless, it is impossible to read the Bible without understanding that that is what is being said. There's no sense of dreamy carelessness. It's rather a decisive readiness. Now, we understand this in our own day in some measure, don't we? Uh, our cars all ring bells to make us buckle up. You will be more secure, and other people will be more secure if you will buckle up. Before you take off on an airliner, uh, they almost inevitably will say, make sure that your seatbelt is fastened low and tight across your lap. And if you hit turbulence on the way, it's not uncommon for somebody to come on and say, you might want to give your belt just another little tug, which is, uh, which is usually as a warning for you might want to give it a very, very big tug. But the fact of the matter is we get the picture. There's a measure, there's a sense of readiness. Uh, when you think in terms of austerity, we use the phraseology, tightening one's belt. So that is the picture and that is understandable to us all. But what I want to say to you and suggest to you, and this is to come back to what I mentioned earlier, that while there is no question that uh, the picture of the Roman soldier is before us, I'm not so sure that that was what, under, uh, what was underlying 
Paul's emphasis here as a, as a Jewish man who had a solid understanding of the Old Testament scriptures. Because you see, the battle with the devil and victory in battle with the devil has been secured, accomplished in the Lord Jesus Christ. And when we've studied the Bible together, we've often said to one another, in the Old Testament, Jesus is predicted, and in the Gospels, he's revealed. He's predicted, anticipated in the Bible in all kinds of pictures, one of them being that of a mighty warrior. So, for example, in, in Psalm 24, that is often sung antiphonally um, when it is sung in the metrical form, the question that is asked by the worship leader, uh, who uh, open up the gates so that the king of glory may enter? The, the one person says, who is this king of glory? The response comes, the Lord, strong and mighty in battle, he is the king of glory. Well, who is that? Ultimately, that is Jesus. He is the mighty warrior. He is the one who is valiant in battle. What you have in the Psalms, you have also in the prophecies. And this, I suggest to you, uh, underlies uh, what Paul is saying here. For example, we read Isaiah 11 uh, routinely, and we often stop short of verse 5, where we have this picture of the mighty warrior striking the earth with the rod of his mouth. And then it says, righteousness shall be the belt of his waist and faithfulness the belt of his loins. In Isaiah 52, it, is, it, it describes uh, the, the shoes that are worn by the mighty warrior, pointing forward. How lovely on the mountains are the feet of them that bring good news. And, it, it, and, and Paul's saying a little later on, he says, and your feet need to be shod with the gospel of peace. In Isaiah 59, uh, you, have, you have the same thing. I mean, you can search for this and, and uh, find it on your own with, with, a, with a good concordance. Isaiah 59, 17, he put on righteousness as a breastplate and a helmet of salvation on his head, and he put on garments of vengeance for clothing, and he wrapped himself in zeal as a cloak. When you read the Old Testament, you say, well, who is this? Well, the Bible is pointing forward to the fulfillment in the Lord Jesus. Now, the reason I mention this is because it seems to me that the basic elements of the armor of God come, if you like, from Paul's pen, not simply in light of the picture of the Roman soldier, but in light of his knowledge of the Lord as the divine warrior. Now, why would this matter, and how would it help? Let me tell you. Do you remember when we studied in the fruit of the Spirit? And when we studied the fruit of the Spirit, we were at pains to make sure we understood that this is actually fruit. We used the picture of a Christmas tree, if I recall, and we said when you have a Christmas tree, it is possible to hang ornaments on them. They are external to the tree. They do not emerge from the tree. They have no life in themselves. And we said, when we read concerning the fruit of the Spirit, this is not things, characteristics, uh, design or labels that we attach to ourselves spiritually, but it is rather that which is produced by the Holy Spirit within us. And so we start to warn one another against an approach to the Christian life, which essentially said, what you're supposed to do is try and be as much like Jesus as you can, and if you hang a few of those things on yourself, then you will look far more like Jesus than you will if you don't, which is, of course, futility. Similarly here, and this is why I pointed out, it's possible to read this section as though what Paul is doing is simply urging us to be good, urging us to be good. You see, wearing the armor here is not about becoming enough like Christ to defeat Satan. Now, you need to understand that. It's not about trying to become more like Jesus so that I might be victorious in the battle. It is about standing confidently in Christ's triumph, which has already taken place over Satan in the cross. 
that Jesus Christ is the valiant warrior who is to come. He has gone toe-to-toe with the evil one in the wilderness, in the temptations. He has answered him in the same way that we are to answer him, as we will see later on, by taking the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. That's how Jesus handled it there. And in going face to face with him in the cross, he has triumphed over the evil one, over death, over sin, over the grave. He has accomplished all of it. That's why the hymn that we just sang read, put on the gospel armor. Put on the gospel armor. What does it mean, the gospel armor? Simply what it says, that our armor is ultimately the gospel. It is to put on the gospel. Let me give it to you in the words of a hymn, where the writer says to the Lord, be thou my shield and hiding place. You be my shield and hiding place. That sheltered near your side, I may my fierce accuser face and tell him thou hast died. In other words, When the evil one comes to insinuate, to attack, to say, I can't believe that you think those thoughts. I can't believe that you left that undone. I can't believe that you are as you are, and so on. The answer does not lie in our saying, oh, but wait a minute. I I had a very good week two weeks ago. Did you count that? Or I'm doing this or I'm doing that. No, the answer is, to confront our accuser and tell him Jesus died. Because what are you saying? You're saying, you took your best shot, evil one, and Jesus died, bore our sins, triumphed over them, and we are now in him. We are united in him. Some of you will have those dolls at home. I think they call them Russian dolls. Um, I, I have some with uh, um, Gorbachev on it and, and uh, Yeltsin and, and some others. And, and when you t- they're, they're fun to play with. You know how they are. You take, you, you take them apart, and then you go further and further down, and then eventually you've got a tiny little uh, fellow in here who doesn't come apart anymore. And then when you've done that, then you put them all back together again. That's about the fun of it for, for an afternoon. But... But there, there is something of a picture in that, isn't there? That I am the, ti- I am the tiny little person in, enclosed in Christ. You see, when the evil one comes to me, he says, no, I'm, 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 I'm very strong. I'm, I'm, I'm making great progress. I'm feeling amazing, you know. The evil one knows this, this fellow's going down, for sure. No, you see, there's only one place, and the place is safe in the arms of Jesus is hidden in the gospel. That's why you see the issue is always the gospel. That's why the issue is, do I know Christ in this way? Have I come to entrust myself to him? Have I admitted who he is and who I am and why I need him and so on? Or am I just a religious person seeking somehow or another to do my best as I make my journey. There's all the difference in the world. Paul, remember, in chapter one, is writing to those who have heard the word of truth, the gospel of their salvation. Now, the picture then is pretty straightforward, isn't it? The question is, is Paul then, when he talks about the belt of truth, talking about truth as in truth in the inner man, or sincerity, or our own personal truthfulness, or is he speaking about truth in an objective sense, that is, in the sense of that which is outside of us and in Christ and in the gospel? Well, without delaying on it, it's possible to mar- marshal the uh, Bible evidence uh, in support of both positions. Uh, Paul already has talked about uh, speaking truth with our neighbors in chapter 4, and he does that throughout his letters. Uh, He also, though, is concerned to make sure that people understand the nature of the truth and so on. In my own simplicity of mind, I have concluded that it needn't be either or, and it's probably safe to say it's both and. 
that surely to take up the belt of truth is to uh, ensure that since Jesus is the truth, and since the gospel has come to us as the truth, uh, one of the evidences that we are uh, truth trusters is that we are truth tellers, so that the subjective dimension of the work of grace is in evidence in our lives. My inclination, though, is to view what he's saying here in terms of this uh, belt more in the objective way. Uh, in other words, what Paul says elsewhere about the importance of the faith or about the gospel or about the good deposit, uh, it just seems to me in keeping with the emphasis on the truth itself. And certainly when we realize that it is only the truth of the gospel that can dispel the lies of the evil one and set us free. That's why I think Paul is constantly emphasizing this in, in, in all of his writings. As he gets to the end of his life, as he is now in jail for the last time, as he writes his letter to Timothy, what is his great concern for Timothy? It is that Timothy will remain committed to the truth, that he will make sure that the truth of the gospel he, that has been that has come to him first through his grandmother and then through his mother, and that has now become his very own, that he will not deviate from course in relationship to it, that he will hold fast to the truth, that he will keep as a pattern of sound words that which has been conveyed to him. And in that very same letter, he reminds Timothy that he has in his congregation those who are always learning but never able to arrive at a knowledge of the truth. In Ephesians, in the previous chapter, where he has described the provision that God has made for his church in the ministry of the apostles and in the inscripturated truth that the apostles then uh, penned, he says, and the reason God has given this to us is in order that we may no longer be as children, tossed to and fro, carried about by every wave and by every wind of doctrine. What's the key? the belt of truth, that we have come to a conviction about the truth. Somebody said to us one day, have you ever read the New Testament? We said, no, I never read it. And we read it, and we discovered that it introduced us to Jesus. And we discovered Jesus not just as a figure of history, but as a Savior and as a friend. And we entrusted our lives to him. And we declared that Jesus is Lord. And then it was Jesus that gave to us our doctrine of Scripture. We realized that Jesus believed the Bible, that Jesus taught the Bible, that Jesus spoke the very words that the Father had given him to speak. And so we came to convictions about the truth of the Bible because we came to convictions about the truth concerning Jesus. That's how it actually happens. And it stands out in distinct um, confrontation with the vagueness and the accommodation that is increasingly part of our culture. Our culture is confused about many things, but it's certainly confused about truth and whether there is such a thing as objective truth. And the pressure is so hard, I don't know how you find it, but it is very hard when you're in company with a group of people who all believe completely differently from yourself is a huge temptation to become a little vague, to become a little accommodating, to suddenly say, well, you know, um, perhaps tolerance and acceptance uh, will, you know, win the war a little more than truth statements. But that's one of the schemes of the devil. That's exactly what has happened in churches all across the Western world ever since uh, the, particularly at the end of the 19th century and the, the thought forms of German scholarship that invaded uh, the minds of many who wanted to be thought very, very wise and effective. And so they thought, well, if we just demythologize some of this, if we just dismantle some of these pieces, if we just become more afraid on the edges and a little more accommodating, then what we'll find, I'm sure, is that people will just flock to us and they will be delighted to, to realize that we really don't know what we're talking about at all. And it will make them feel very comfortable. 
And what has happened? The churches are empty, the lights are off, the doors are closed. And they deserve to be. John Stott, uh, some years ago, uh, makes the amazing statement where he says, just as the world is becoming more aware of its need, the church is becoming less assured of its mission. And the major reason for the diminishing Christian mission is the diminishing confidence in the Christian message. Don't you find the pressure? I had a letter this week from somebody who wrote to me. He said, I know you teach the Bible, but you need to realize, Alistair, that the Bible was written a long time ago, and we have all moved on. And therefore, the things that you're saying from that Bible are just completely irrelevant. They, they, she said, well, there's, there, there are nice elements to them, but the complexity of modern life is such that the Bible is just obviously inadequate. Now, what are we going to do with this? What's the response? You might want to give that belt an extra tug. Turbulence when our friends say these things. When they say to us, well, you're not very Christian. Don't they say that? How can you be so Christian if you're going to define things? If you were Christian, you wouldn't define things. If you were a really good Christian, you would be far nicer, and, and you wouldn't be so authoritative, so dogmatic, so jolly annoying. Well, and what they're really saying is, you know, it doesn't really matter what you believe. Just as long as you lead a good life and you do your best. Sounds so cozy, doesn't it? And you kind of don't want to go, oh, I don't know about that. But if you're going to be a Christian soldier, you're going to have to go, oh, I don't know about that. Jesus says to the woman at the well, why don't you go call your husband? She said, well, I don't have a husband. He said, no, you're right. You've had five husbands, and you've got a live-in lover. Put his finger on her life so that he might give to her the living water. Define the issues so that she might then be confronted with the truth. If we do not do what Scripture does— then we have no basis upon which to be able to make application of the truth. For example, we all know John 3.16, and we quote it from time to time, and helpfully so. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, because we're all going to perish. We're perishing as a result of our sin. Would not perish, but would instead have eternal life. Whoa. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world. Well, that's good, so we don't want to have a spirit of condemnation about us. But in order that the world might be saved through him. Good, so we want to tell people about the immensity of his love in Jesus. Now, here we go. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. That's pretty defined, isn't it? When our friends tell us that their intelligence will see them through in the end, when they tell us that modern knowledge is able to sit in judication over the revelation of God in Scripture, where do we turn? We turn to the truth. And with this, I will finish. But remember when Paul writes to the Corinthians, and the Corinthians had a, an interest in things that was fairly rarefied, and they enjoyed high talk. And he says to them, when I came to you, I didn't play any of those games. I didn't use any of those cards. And the reason I didn't do it, that I didn't try and impress you with words of human wisdom, was in case the cross of Christ would be emptied of its power. For the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved it is the power of God. Where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? 
Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom, it pleased God through the folly of what we preach to save those who believe. As our friend David Wells puts it in one of his little booklets, we do not, that God is beyond the realm of our intuitive radar, that there is no intellectual road to God, that the only way we ever know God is by means of his revelation. And he has revealed himself ultimately in he who is the way, the truth, and the life. And no one ever comes to the Father except through him. And Paul says, I want to make sure that you understand that my speech, my message, they weren't implausible words of wisdom, but in a demonstration of the Spirit and of power. Why? So that your faith might not rest in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. So every time you find yourself saying, oh, but you can't possibly believe that. Or don't you realize that science has disproved that? Don't you realize that that was just a perspective from the first century about gender and about marriage? Don't you realize that we've superseded all of that? Surely you're not saying this. You're not saying that. To the extent that you find yourself sucked into that vortex, I say to you, hide yourself away in the finished work of Christ and tighten the belt and engage in the battle. This morning, serendipitously, I went into uh, one of the rooms upstairs, and I realized that somebody had left me a copy uh, of Grace Abounding to the Chief of Sinners uh, by Bunyan, 17th century work by Bunyan. Bunyan, he writes uh, of how, as he surveys his life, it's amazing to him, he says, that given how bad and horrible and useless I am, that God's grace would abound to me. And as it happens, I just turned to the, the conclusion, not purposefully, but I opened it there, and, and here's what it said. Of all the temptations, writes Bunyan, that I ever met with in my life, to question the being of God and truth of his gospel is the worst, and the worst to be born when this temptation comes. It takes away my girdle from me and removeth the foundation from under me. Oh, I have often thought of that word. Have your loins girt about with truth. Of all the temptations that have come to me, he says, the worst that I would doubt God and doubt his word. Oh, how we need to fasten on the belt of truth. Uh, Just a prayer. Father, even as we study these things, the evil one attacks us. We thank you for the fact that although the message of the cross is foolishness, to us by nature, that a, that a Galilean carpenter hanging a, uh, upon a Roman gibbet would have anything to say to us all these years later. And certainly the idea that, that there, outside the city walls of Jerusalem, took place the pivotal event of human history is absolute folly to the world. But to those who believe, it's everything. Lord, forgive our unbelief. Help us to believe, to buckle up. For Jesus' sake, amen. I invite you to turn with me to Isaiah and to chapter 59. And I'll read from the 14th verse. Isaiah chapter 59 and verse 14. Justice is turned back, and righteousness stands far away. For truth has stumbled in the public squares, and uprightness cannot enter. Truth is lacking, and he who departs from evil 
makes himself a prey. The Lord saw it, and it displeased him that there was no justice. He saw that there was no man, and wondered that there was no one to intercede. Then his own arm brought him salvation, and his righteousness upheld him. He put on righteousness as a breastplate and a helmet of salvation on his head. He put on garments of vengeance for clothing and wrapped himself in zeal as a cloak. According to their deeds, so will he repay wrath to his adversaries, repayment to his enemies. To the coastlands he will render repayment. So they shall fear the name of the Lord from the west and his glory from the rising of the sun. For he will come like a rushing stream which the wind of the Lord drives. And a Redeemer will come to Zion, to those in Jacob who turn from transgression, declares the Lord. And as for me, this is my covenant with them, says the Lord. My spirit that is upon you and my words that I have put in your mouth shall not depart out of your mouth or out of the mouth of your offspring or out of the mouth of your children's offspring, says the Lord, from this time forth and forevermore. Amen. Just a brief prayer. Make the book live to me, O Lord. Show me yourself within your word. Show me myself and show me my Savior and make the book live to me. For Jesus' sake, amen. Well, we've begun to look at this section here in Ephesians 6, where Paul is encouraging the readers to be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might, to put on the whole armor of God. We began to look last time at the belt of truth and now at the breastplate of righteousness. Uh, during the week, as I was studying, uh, as happens to me routinely, one of the songs from my childhood came back to mind. It goes like this. There's a fight to be fought. There's a race to be run. There are dangers to meet on the way. But the Lord is my life, and the Lord is my light, and the Lord is my strength and stay. On his word I depend. He's my savior and friend, and he helps me to trust and obey. For the Lord is my life, and the Lord is my light, and the Lord is my strength and stay. As I say so often to you, I'm so grateful uh, for parents who brought me up in a context where these kind of truths would be embedded in my young mind before I realized the significance of them all, so that even to today, uh, they still provide guidance and direction for me as I turn to the Bible. Now, we're aware of the fact that the, the Apostle Paul uh, uses pictures, he uses metaphors in order to teach and does so with great effectiveness. Uh, he uses athletics with frequency, architecture, agriculture, and also, as here, warfare. Warfare. And as we noted last time, uh, the full armor of God has a picture by which the reader may uh, attach identification in the Roman soldier. But in actual fact, uh, the underlying picture is probably that of the valiant warrior that is described for us in the Psalms and in the prophets. And it's for that reason that I had read earlier from Isaiah chapter 59, where uh, God himself steps forward and uh, his arm reaches out in salvation, and he provides uh, the righteousness that we require. Now, it is important to recognize that Paul, in writing in this way, is writing to those who are in Christ, to those who have, as he puts it in verse 13 of chapter 1, um, heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, as he puts it, and they have believed in the Lord Jesus Christ. And as a result of that, to stick with the metaphor, they have been enlisted as soldiers in Christ's army. And having been enlisted, they are then provided with all the resources that are required for spiritual warfare. 
As I reached that point in my thinking, I, I paused, and I paused purposefully. And I want to do so with you also. Let, let, me, let me say this. I want, throughout the course of today, for us to try and answer three questions. Now, question number one, am I a soldier of the cross? Question number two, am I wearing the breastplate of righteousness? Question number three, am I guarding my heart from the schemes of the devil? And I will spend virtually uh, the, the greater part of this morning on this first question, am I a soldier of the cross? I take that actually from the opening line of a hymn by Isaac Watts, am I a soldier of the cross, a follower of the Lamb? And the reason I stop here is because some of us, if we are honest, have to acknowledge the fact that for us to consider what it might mean to wear this armor is actually premature. And for this reason, because some of us, by our own testimony, are not actually members of the army. We have not actually come to the place where we have entrusted our lives unreservedly to the Lord Jesus Christ. If we've been coming here for any length of time, there's no doubt that we have heard the word of truth. There's no doubt that we will have been reminded that it is the gospel of salvation. But the real question is, have we believed? Have we believed? You see, when the Bible uses believe, it doesn't use it simply in terms of an intellectual assent to various propositions or ideas or doctrines. To believe or to have faith means to transfer trust from self to Christ. To transfer trust from self to Christ. Every so often, perhaps, in the realm of moving from one place to another, uh, you may have had occasion to take uh, what was yours in a bank in one state and make sure that it was placed securely in a bank in another state. It was once there, and now it has been moved to there. And that lies at the very heart of what it means to be a Christian soldier. And I want, I want without embarrassment, to ask you to ask yourself this question. Am I a soldier of the cross? Now, a soldier of the cross, someone who's enlisted in Christ's army, will not be saying things like this. And this is routinely said by many. Because I have lived a pretty good life up until now, I'm sure that God will be gracious to me and make up any deficit that there happens to be, and hopefully I'll be fine. The kind of approach that says, in relationship to our consideration of religion and of the Bible and of the, the Christian gospel, well, I believe in a God who helps those who help themselves. Or an approach which comes to the gospel and says, as best I understand it, if I do these certain things, or don't do these certain things, then uh, God will do uh, his part. In other words, it is a sense of self-reliance, or even a reliance on religion, or even a reliance on a conviction about certain ideas. Now, the Bible is full of illustrations of those who were not soldiers of the cross, uh, and who never consider themselves to be remotely near to it. And that may be you. And you're saying, I'll be the last person ever to become a follower of Jesus. You mean like Saul of Tarsus, uh, who was very, very convinced of his position as a religious man, as an orthodox man, as a clever man. And in fact, he relied on all of that, and he tells us in his writings that that was his whole uh, perspective on life. And what changed? Well, he met Jesus. He actually came face to face with Jesus. And then he says, my entire perspective on the world and on life and on heaven and on hell and on Jesus was radically changed. Whereas before, I had a righteousness of my own. 
my background, my behavior, my approach to things. Not, but now he says, no, not having a righteousness any longer of my own, one that comes from the law. In other words, one that comes about as a result of being able to say, I did this, and I did this, and I did this, but I didn't do this, and I didn't do this, and I didn't do this. Not from that, he says, but the righteousness that comes from God through faith in Jesus Christ, the righteousness that depends on faith. The righteousness that depends on faith. When he writes to the church in Rome, the passage that we had read for us earlier, he puts it with great clarity. Listen to what he says. No one can justify themselves before God by a perfect performance of the law's demands. Indeed, it is the straight edge of the law that shows us how crooked we are. You see, people come to church and they, they come with this notion that I think if I go there, I might feel better about everything. And then they don't actually feel better about very much at all. And they're very opposed to the idea that they would ever feel worse about anything in order that they might feel better about everything. When in actual fact, the story of the gospel makes us feel worse before we feel better. And you will never feel better until first you feel worse. That's why the law of God, in all of its demands, confronts us with our own crookedness. Because it is so straight. Because it says, you will have no other gods before me then we realize, but I've got all kinds of little substitute gods that you shouldn't covet other things. But I'm often jealous that you should be truthful with your neighbor. Well, sometimes I tell what I call white lies. And before we know where we are, we realize that we are so far in the wrong that there is no way that we could ever live long enough or do anything well enough to get our credit balance back to where we thought it ought to be. And what makes it even worse is that the wages of sin is death. The wages of sin is death. Sin pays wages. Adam and Eve sin, and death enters into the world. In the day that you disobey me, you will surely die. Physical death, spiritual death enters into the world. We are by nature spiritually dead. We all will one day die physically. If we die physically while still dead spiritually, we will be lost from God for all of eternity. That is what the Bible says. But you see, the Bible does not simply say the wages of sin is death. It goes on to say the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, his Son. And that's what Paul does in that same passage as Dan read it for us earlier in Romans. He says, here's the deal. Now a righteousness from God. This righteousness from God comes through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe, to all who transfer trust from self to Christ. You see, faith means believing that certain things are true. But the simple believing of the truthfulness of things is not the same as saving faith. It's not just believing a sort of abstract idea or even believing that there was a Jesus or that presumably he did what he said he was doing. There's, not, no, there's no transformation of life in that. It involves believing certain things that are true. It involves trusting in those things. It involves entering into the benefit of these things. Church history helps us, not only the history of the Bible, but the history of the church. Uh, Martin Luther, who was a very, very excellent fellow, born in a peasant's home, but very clever by God's amazing goodness, uh, qualifies as a lawyer, is involved in religious pursuits, uh, spends time in a convent, goes up to Rome, 
in the hope that somehow or another he'll be able to settle this righteousness thing because he desperately wanted to know that he was righteous enough so that God would say, you're okay with me. And in the beginning of the 16th century, as he's there in Rome and going through all these religious exercises, he tries his best, but nothing works. All of his exercises, all the things that he's told provide forgiveness, provide uh, peace and hope and everything, none of them do by his own testimony. And then it dawns upon him. He says, I've been real. I've been thinking about this upside down. I was thinking about righteousness in terms of something that I produced, something that I would do in order to make myself acceptable to God. And then he suddenly, it dawned on me. He said, I realize that this righteousness is from God. It's from God. And then he writes, here I felt that I was altogether born again and had entered paradise itself through open gates. Can I ask you, uh, are you a soldier of the cross? You see, this is the very beginning of, of serving in the Christian army, when we recognize that we come with nothing in our hands except the fact that our hands are dirty and needs to be cleansed. This is what it actually means to wear the breastplate of righteousness. Because to wear the breastplate of righteousness simply means to keep trusting the gospel, to keep trusting that it is Jesus' righteousness which qualifies me for heaven and which saves me from condemnation. Now, when that actually dawns on a person, when that dawns on a person, you will discover that there is nothing boastful about them. There's nothing that makes them as sound peculiarly self-righteous. No, because they will realize. I, I, I can't even fathom how it is that my eyes have been opened and my heart has been changed. They will be prepared to acknowledge what Paul says at the end of 1 Corinthians 1. Because of him, that is God, you are in Christ Jesus. Because of him, you're in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God, righteousness and sanctification and redemption, so that as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. What does that mean, boast in the Lord? Well, it means to sing what we just sang. Jesus, your blood and righteousness. It's your blood and righteousness that clothes me and covers me. I didn't earn it. I couldn't earn it. My background, my good deeds, my endeavors, my religious pursuits, all of them just left me in the same predicament. Perhaps you went to a church where the person encouraged you along these lines and says, now you're a fine soul, and you're just trying and do a little better. Try and, get your, try and get your grade point average up. Try and see if you can get a few more frequent attender miles so that eventually you'll get, you get a better seat. Uh, on, on your journey into heaven. And you listen to that stuff, and you said, something is peculiarly wrong here. Certainly, if you have your Bible open, it is. Perhaps you were the kind of person who was saying, you know, I'm, I'm actually a pretty good person. I'm not sure I need this. It's good for some other people in my office. And it was the gospel, the law of God, that pierced your pride, that bubble. Or perhaps you find yourself coming and sitting near the back and saying, I'm in such a mess that I don't think there's any hope for me. And it's that same gospel that lifts you up and says it's about the Lord Jesus. So that one day, as the hymn writer puts it, when he will come with trumpet sound, oh, may I then in him be found, clothed in his righteousness alone and faultless to stand before the throne. That's our first question. I've spent time on it. I felt that I should. Am I a soldier? I remember my father telling me in the Second World War when he was just 19 years old, through the letterbox in their home in Glasgow came the almost inevitable envelope, and that was his call-up papers. And he was to report at a certain time and uh, enlisted in the army for the Second World War. 
Maybe today is the day when the call-up papers arrive in your box. You've been avoiding the thought for a while, and yet it comes. It has your name on it. Maybe it's a result of the fact that you came along to a vacation Bible camp, and you went away thinking, you know, I think my children have this, and I don't have it. That may be the case. They may be members of the army, and you're not. Perhaps you sit next to your spouse, whom you know genuinely has transferred trust from self to Christ, and you haven't. Then may I ask you, why not today? May I urge you to seek Christ and to cease trusting in anything other than Christ, in short order, to believe. Am I a soldier of the cross? Secondly, am I wearing the breastplate of righteousness? Now, this breastplate was an important, a crucial piece of the armor. It covered both the front and the back. And sometimes it was made of uh, very hard substances, and other times it was made differently. But essentially, it protected from the neck to the thighs, both front and back. In Pilgrim's Progress, uh, in the confrontation with Apollyon, Bunyan makes the point that there was no protection for the back. And uh, which, of course, is a wonderful picture. You know, we're going on, we're going straight ahead at the evil one. You know, we don't, we don't ever turn our back on him. Yes, we do. Yes, we do. Sometimes we're running for our lives. And it's good to know the protection goes, goes all the way around. It protects the vital organs of our lives, our hearts, our lungs, the crucial bits and pieces. Again, it is a metaphor. What is it then that protects us from the assaults of the evil one? What is it that protects us from these things? The answer is the breastplate of righteousness. Now, as last time, we have to consider this. Do we need to determine that this is either an objective righteousness, which is ours in Christ, or a subjective righteousness, which is then ours by way of Christian character and growth in godliness? My answer to this is the same as my answer to the belt of truth, namely, that it needn't be either or. It is probably, it is both and, because the righteousness that is required of us is not one that we can produce. But when we rest in the righteousness that is ours in Jesus, the work of the Spirit of God then conforms us to the image of Jesus, thereby making us more righteous in and of ourselves. So, for example, that's why in verse 24 of chapter 4, Paul is said to put on the new creature created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and in holiness. And similarly, in, in verse 9 of chapter 5, for the fruit of light is found in all that is good and right and true. The point to make and to understand is that one does not exist without the other. One does not exist without the other. In other words, we cannot be the beneficiaries of the objective righteousness of Christ without the evidence is present in our own righteous living. Uh, Sinclair puts it wonderfully helpfully when he says, we are now the recipients of an irrevocable righteousness in Christ, which in turn leads to a growth in righteousness in ourselves. But the one precedes the other. Calvin, similarly, the Son of God, though spotlessly pure, took upon himself the ignominy and shame of our sin, and in return clothed us with his purity. You might find it helpful to realize that the Puritans used to speak in terms of a righteousness that was imputed and then a righteousness that was imparted. And what they were seeking to do was make the distinction between the objective and the subjective. In other words, as we have just said, there is nothing that we would be able to bring in and of ourselves to make us acceptable to God. Since God's standard is absolute perfection, 
none of us is able to go before God. The only way that we would be able to go before God if we were then clothed in a righteousness that is not our own. If we were only accepted in Jesus, included in Jesus, enclosed in Jesus, by grace through faith. You see, in Jesus, it is wrong for people to think that somehow or another, the message of the gospel is that God, because Jesus died on the cross, God is just, he's not really bothered about sin anymore. Nothing could be further from the truth. God is intensely concerned about sin. To the extent that the burden of my sin is borne by his own sinless son on the cross. So that this is the doctrine of imputation. That all of my wretchedness, all of my sinfulness, all of my rebellion, my transgression, my iniquity, which all, all of that ugly stuff has been imputed to Christ. And all of Christ's righteousness, his standing before the Father, has been imputed to the believing saint. And saint in terms of follower of Jesus. There's nothing like this, you see, in contemporary religion. Religionists scorn at this. Religious people often make fun of this, suggesting somehow or another that this is far too easy a thing, that somehow or another, by believing, I might be saved. <laughs> Yeah, again, Luther. Luther was doing all the stuff you're supposed to do. He did it to a T. He did it two times over, if necessary, until he realized, I just need to believe. Lord, I believe thy precious blood. We just sang about it. And what does it mean to believe? It means that I no longer believe in myself. It means that I no longer rest in myself. It means that I no longer have to boast about myself. It means that I no longer have to be dishonest about myself or suggest to people that I'm better than I am because I'm not. So let him who boasts boast in the Lord. A wonderful Savior is Jesus, my Lord. A wonderful Savior to me. He hideth, hideth my soul in the cleft of a rock where rivers of mercy I see. You see, it's Jesus. And his righteousness, which is the protection against all of the onslaughts. One of the great onslaughts of the evil one is to get us to look at ourselves rather than to look at Christ. William Goodge, who lived in the, fifth, in the 16th and the 17th century, he was a minister in a, in a church in London in Blackfriars, St. Anne's of Blackfriars, uh, for 45 years. And he wrote a book, amongst a number of books that he wrote, On the Armor of God. And he makes this point. When I look upon myself, I see nothing but emptiness and weakness. But when I look upon Christ, I see nothing but fullness and sufficiency. You see, the gospel always turns us back to Jesus. And maybe this quote from another American theologian will help us as I draw this to a close and anticipate uh, the, the third question. Writes Warfield, there's nothing in us or done by us at any stage of our earthly development because of which we are acceptable to God. You get that sentence? There is nothing in us or done by us 
at any stage of our earthly development because of which we are acceptable to God. We must always be accepted for Christ's sake, or we cannot be accepted at all. This is not true of us only when we believe. It is just as true after we've believed. It will continue to be true as long as we live. Our need of Christ does not cease with our believing, nor does the nature of our relation to him or to God through him ever alter. No matter what our attainments in Christian graces or our achievements in behavior may be, it is always on his blood and righteousness alone that we can rest. That declaration is the declaration of a longtime pilgrim, of a soldier, who, by God's amazing grace, had ceased to trust in self and had come to trust in Christ. And as he gets towards the end of his Christian pilgrimage, he realizes from the very beginning to the very end, all of my standing before God is in a righteousness that is not my own, but is imputed to those who, in turning to God in Christ, have said, I am the sinner. You are the Savior. I want to close with the benefits of all that becomes mine by trusting Jesus. Everything else is shaky material upon which to live life and certainly to face death. I appeal to you, if you remain standing, as it were, on the esplanade watching the soldiers go by, step up, take your place, trust Christ. Father, thank you. Thank you that in the Lord Jesus you have provided for us our wisdom, our justification, our righteousness, our redemption. Lord, help us to absolutely believe with a sitting down kind of trusting belief in Christ alone, in whose name we pray. Amen. Amen, brothers and sisters. I hope you all wake up to the fact there's no way to earn your way to the Father. The only way is through Jesus Christ. Just come to Him. Don't forget to pray for the children, fellow brothers and sisters all around the world, and for those still lost in the darkness so that they too can see the light. May our Father bless you. May He keep you. May His grace shine upon you, give you peace. I'll see you next time.